This is the web transmission service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. On May the 22nd, we hosted our annual Member and Daughter Night. Our guest of honor was Sergeant Ramanjit Bachu. Canadian Sikh from Hamilton, Ontario. Motivated by gratitude for opportunities her family found in Canada, she has been a member of the Royal Canadian Air Force since January of 2006. Sergeant, Sergeant Bachu uh, embarked on her journey in the RCAF as an avionics technician after completing two years of post-secondary education in computer engineering at Rob Brock University and later transferring to Niagara College. She serviced many aircraft types, including the CC-130 Legacy Hercules, the C-130J, whatever that is, and the CH-147 Chinook. <coughs> Notable milestones in her career include an early deployment to Afghanistan and a good show award for excellence in flight safety which included a feature article in Flight Comment magazine. Sergeant Bachu experienced a dynamic progression through various military roles from technical positions to quality management, and eventually imparting knowledge as an instructor for aspiring avionics technicians. Presently, Sergeant Bachu serves as a course director for the avionics trade at the esteemed Canadian Forces School of Aerospace Technology and Engineering. Beside her military duties, Sergeant Bachu loves decorating. However, since redecorating her home was costing too much money, she taught herself how to bake and designs cakes now for her family. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Sergeant Bachu. Thank you. <laughs> so good evening. I'm Sergeant Romaji Bachu, and before I begin, I'd like to express my gratitude to everyone here at RCMI for inviting me today. It is truly an honor to have this opportunity to, to address you all. I'm a first-generation Canadian of Sikh heritage. My upbringing was deeply rooted in Sikhism, a faith that my elders instilled in me with the utmost reverence, yet never enforced. Immersed in the rich tapestry of Sikh and Hindu traditions, my family encouraged an open-minded exploration of diverse religions, fostering a deep respect for cultural diversity. Being in Canada, my family wholeheartedly embraced Canadian cultures. From decking out Christmas trees with presents to eagerly donning costumes for Halloween and relishing in, relishing in the tradition of our, oh no, I lost, of our <laughs> adopted homeland. School days were filled with the same excitement that everyone else had. Um, our parents helped us with Valentine's Day cards. Um, my mom made us homemade Halloween costumes, took us trick-or-treating, 
Easter, we had Easter egg hunts, even though we don't celebrate Easter, it's just our parents never wanted us to feel left out from what other children were enjoying. Central to our family ethos was the seek principle of seva. Seva means a selfless act of doing things for others without wanting anything in return. Every Christmas, we eagerly participate in preparing and distributing food to homeless shelters, reinforcing the value of compassion and generosity. Visits to the temple weren't just about prayer, they were about opportunities to engage in communal cooking and cleaning, instilling a sense of responsibility towards community welfare. A pivotal moment came when my parents took my brother, my sister, and myself back to India in, in the early 2000s, where we witnessed firsthand the humble living conditions endured by our relatives. The stark reality of life without modern amenities like indoor plumbing or electricity left an indelible mark on me. It stirred within me a profound sense of gratitude for the opportunities afforded to us in Canada. So the first picture I'm going to show you guys here is a picture of my grandma. That picture was taken in the early 1970s, and as you can see, she's prepping food outside. When my parents took us to India, they actually took us to the house that my grandma grew up in, and um, her brother still lived there. It was a gated, there's two bedrooms, you walk into the gated area, it's complete dirt, a cow tied to a tree, and two rooms. One room was for sleeping, one room was for guests, and then obviously cooking outside. And that was in the 2000s. Um, my grandparents came here in the 90s, my parents in the 80s, and my grandpa's brother came here in the early 1960s, and that's how they all emigrated here. And what Canada has given our family is so immensely, like we're very, very grateful for it. And to see what they have now from where they came, I'm grateful. Joining the military wasn't just a career choice for me, it was a heartfelt commitment to serve my country and honor the values instilled in me by my upbringing. It became a means to channel my gratitude into tangible action, allowing me to contribute to this country while pursuing a fulfilling career path. In 2005, after two years of university and four years of college in computer engineering, I initiated the rigorous application process to join the military, setting the wheels in motion for a transformative journey. December 2005, I got the call that I was accepted into the CAF as an avionics technician, and by January 2006, I was immersed in the challenging terrain of basic training, laying the foundation for what would become a defining chapter in my life. The decision to pursue a career in the military came as a surprise to my parents, who had envisioned a more conventional path for me, perhaps as an accountant, lawyer, doctor, or even a teacher. Their initial reaction was one of dismay, compounded by concerns about my unmarried status and the prospect, and the prospect of me venturing far from home. However, as time passed, and they witnessed the pride others expressed in knowing that I was in the military service, their apprehension gradually evolved into a sense of pride and acceptance. Basic training was definitely an experience for me. Um, I was called princess the entire way through. I never went camping, never used a porta potty. Just growing up, our parents did everything for us. They wanted us to have more than they had, so our focus was really on school. Yes, I knew how to clean, I knew how to do my laundry, I just, I never really had to do it because my mom always did it. My grandma lived across the road from us. She brought us food every day after school. If we weren't home on time, she would literally tie in a bag and tie it to the door so we would have food after school. So we never really had to cook. So basic training was very, very different for me. Um, so talking about basic training, we obviously had room inspections and everything. This was supposed to be our bed layout. This, this is what our bed looked like. <laughs> the last day of basic training, I uh, did a princess bed layout for my staff. <laughs> I, they did not get to see it because they canceled our inspection, but the fact that I did it was pretty good. So in 2000, oh, sorry, uh, my first posting after basic training was with 8 Air Maintenance Squadron in Trenton, Ontario, where I worked on the CC-130 Hercules aircraft. Stepping onto the plane for the first time was very overwhelming. I vivid, vividly recall being guided through its intricate systems by Master Corporal Gary Stevenson, 
who patiently introduced me to the myriad of responsibilities that our trade entailed. With avionics, um, we manage all the electrical electronic components. Anything with the wire is what we're responsible for. Whether it be maintaining it, upgrading it, or just testing it to make sure it works, that's what we're responsible for. And just knowing that that is what I had to do, I honestly feel like I blacked out when he was going through everything with me because the C-130 Hercules, I don't have a picture of it, but it's like, a giant truck, you can carry anything in it. So it's a pretty big aircraft. So as I gradually acclimated to my role and gained a deeper understanding of my duties, the once daunting task of working on the aircraft became second nature to me, as if I had done it all my life. In 2009, I was afforded the opportunity, and I call it an opportunity because it's not something that everyone else gets to do. But I was afforded the opportunity to join a deployment to Afghanistan in Kandahar Airfield as part of the 8 Air Maintenance Squadron team. Unlike a conventional deployment with the military, it's normally six months at a time. With uh, AAMS, we did two month tasks, so it would be two months in the theater and then two months home. And I did that for a total of six months, so three rows. When, um, sorry, our crew consisted of 10 people, eight men, two women. Every time they took women to a deployment, they ensured that we were in pairs because there were times where we did have to share um, sleeping quarters and obviously it was easier for two women to share as opposed to have one room mm -hmm. um, for one individual. So the next picture is of me and my crew overseas. If I can get the pointer here. I'm gonna point out two people in here because I'll talk about them later. This is Dan, I used to call him Dad, the entire time. And this is Alex. Alex is my roommate, we still talk. Dan and I still talk, he's retired. And Alex and I, um, every, like, I'll message her every five years and it's like, we didn't lose touch at all. During our pre-deployment training, um, me with my rose-colored glasses on, being the princess that I am, the guys that had deployed, they would come up to me and be like, hey, Rob, my nickname is Rob. Um, we all went to Afghanistan, it's great, like, don't worry about it. The only thing you really have to worry about are a couple of rock attacks, but Kandahar Air Airfield, other than that, is really safe. So you'll have a good time. And I'm like, okay, like, let me pack my bags, go to Afghanistan, I'm good. Our initial deployment was very uneventful. We stayed in tents, right here. Um, each tent, <laughs> yeah. Um, each tent has housed eight individuals. They're called ten man tents because you can have ten people in there. But the first two spaces, they had benches for us to do our briefings, play card games, and stuff. So there was eight people in that tent, and Alex and I were with six other guys um, in those living quarters. If you look at the next picture here, this is inside the tent. So the first picture, right? Sorry, the first picture right here it was taken from the front door. So that there is a back door, and my bunk was the last one on the left. So. If you look at it, there's just a whole bunch of sheets separating us from the next bed space, and our bed space was pretty tight. It was a twin bed with a little area to put your stuff. I took a whole bunch of stuff that was pink, yes. <laughs> but when they did our laundry, you had to put it into one laundry bag, you drop it off to get it washed. They actually wash everything in the bag. They'll take it out, fold it, and then give it back to you. So it was just easier for me to identify what bag was mine from the rest of the guys. So the first night we're in Kandahar while making my way to the facilities, because with the tents, obviously there's no washrooms. Um, all the facilities from where we were, were about a two minute walk. So I had to go in the middle of the night. We got into our, like I got into my FFO, which means I had my helmet on, tack vest, weapons, and then you leave. Um, and it was dark. This is my first night in Kandahar, and uh, they issued us this little light I can't even tell you the size of it. Maybe it was the size of this pen cap. 
And uh, that lit my way to the bathrooms. And on my way there, I'm like, hmm, why don't we have lights? Maybe I should ask this tomorrow. I forgot to ask that question the next day. And uh, we went into work, we did 12 hour shifts, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., got home, and we had our first rocket attack. And then it dawned on me, okay, maybe they don't have lights so the enemy's, enemy can't see where we are. So I'm so glad I did not ask that question. <laughs> um, during our first roto, Dan, like I said, I called him dad. He took on the responsibility of accompanying Alex and myself wherever we went. And I don't think it was like a sexist thing. It was just a fatherly role. He was 17 years older than us, and I think it would give him peace of mind knowing where we were. So anytime we needed to go to the gym, for a walk, anywhere, he accompanied us. During the first roto, I learned how to drive standard. I never knew how to drive one, and every single vehicle in Afghanistan was a standard vehicle. So my main reason for learning to drive standard was just in case of emergency. So if everyone else was injured or something happened, I wanted to be able to drive them and get them out of wherever we were. So uh, my first lesson for driving a standard was if we're along perimeter road. So perimeter road is just that, it's on the perimeter of the base. It's a chain link fence with barbed wire separating us from the um, Afghan, like the local Afghan people. So my first uh, lesson was, if they start shooting at us, just gun it. I don't remember what they said, but they're like, just like, put it into this gear and go. That was my first lesson. So with Perimeter Road, we would have to drive down here um, every day just to get to our airfield. And uh, there was always kids at the fence waving at us. Some of them learned how to flip the bird. That was pleasant. Um, and in January, Afghanistan had a lot of rain, and you wouldn't think a dry climate like that would get that much rain, but um, at one point, and we weren't allowed to take pictures of it, so I don't have a picture, but the fence, like a portion of the fence washed away, so there was nothing really protecting us from the outside forces. This is how much rain we got. Mm. Yeah, so I wasn't allowed to take a picture of that. So the base itself had several dining areas where meals were served four times a day. Everyone, regardless of nationality, was welcome at any dining hall as long as they had a base pass. Being of Indian descent, I received a lot of attention from the local workers. So on the base, there was um, a lot of civilian workers, whether it be contracted or people just to serve at the messes and everything. And the majority of the people that were at the messes were either Punjabi or Hindi and I can speak those languages so I understood quite a bit and then one day I was standing in the mess hall and there's a whole bunch of Indian guys just talking they were talking about me they were trying to figure out if I was Indian and I, I can play dumb pretty well like I can just pretend like I don't know what's going on so they were talking and they're like oh I think she's Indian no she's not they spent about five minutes trying to figure out if I was <laughs> by the end of it they decided no we guess she's not. And the guys that I went with, they would always call me their spy just because I'd be able to understand like all the little conversations that were going on between the workers. Uh, each country also had its own compound. And um, the first row that we were not in the Canadian compound only because there was not enough rooms. So that's why we stayed in the tents. But uh, each compound, they had a clubhouse. The clubhouse had video games, just like board games an area that we could go hang out in, stage, TVs, movies. Uh, the compounds also had um, a gym, living quarters, washroom facilities, showers, all of that. There was also a place in the middle of the base called the boardwalk. I couldn't find an actual picture, an aerial view to show you guys, but that was a boardwalk. Um, it was situated in the center of the base and it's shaped like a hollow square. So it had a whole bunch of shops and restaurants around the outside. There's like little stairs there where you could climb onto it. And in the middle of the hollow square, they had a little volleyball court at the bottom here, um, basketball area, soccer, and hockey. So anyone who wanted to go play could. 
There was uh, TGI Fridays right there, the green beans, they had awesome hot chocolate. We had Tim Hortons, which was always busy. Like you had to get there super, super early, else there would be a really long lineup because every nation went there. And there was a Pizza Hut. Apparently there's a Burger King somewhere around there. I never really went there. And then there was like little shops around the outside. Um, I don't know what they were because I never actually went in. I only visited Friday, TJ Friday's Green Beans Tens and we got Pizza Hut once in a while. So as a technician, um, I gained a lot of extensive knowledge and experience being in Afghanistan. There was only one other person of my trade there working on that aircraft. So anytime there was any issues with the aircraft, we had to figure it out on our own. We didn't have other people to discuss what was going on. We would also get calls from the pilots while they were in flight. And they'd be very cryptic when they'd be talking to us to let us know that they would have issues with the aircraft and what they could do, or if we had parts for them to fix. So we had to learn very quickly about the systems and how they work together. And it, it taught me that I could be a good technician being there, making those decisions on my own. There, um, there was a time where I got the opportunity to go outside of Kandahar. They took me on a flight to Kabul. On the way to Kabul, some of our systems were not working. The defensive electronic warfare systems, which divert rocket attacks away from the aircraft, at any given time, it was off for like 30 seconds at a time. I'd like sit there and time it. So we landed in Kabul. Mind you, I've only been in the military for about four years. And we land, and the pilot's like, okay, what's going on? I'm like, I don't have my tools, so I can't actually see it. And uh, he called the base in Kandahar to the officer in charge, and they're like, okay, this is what's going on. They gave me the satellite phone. They're like, can we fly? I'm like, no. <laughs> like, they wanted me to tell them if they could fly or not. I'm like, it's up to you guys. Like, I can't make that call. I can't fix the system just because I don't even have the tools that I need to test it. Obviously, we ended up flying back. Um, my current partner, he was on the sister crew, so his uh, crew ended up finding what was wrong, and then our crew ended up fixing it. Talking about um, going on trips, there was another one that they offered me to go on, and it was to, um, it was an avalanche that had happened in Kabul in the mountains. And they asked me to go on the mission, and I said no, because it was a recovery mission of locals that had perished in the avalanche. And I told them straight up that it's not something that I would be able to, like, I would be able to do it at that point, but I didn't know how I would deal with it afterwards. Dan ended up going on that mission, and that mission ended up being uh, where they took the survivors and they were going to displace them to another village. He told us that there was this little girl, like a three-year-old girl, with everything that she owned in a basket on her head getting onto our airplane. He was so concerned for that little girl, uh, he watched her the entire time. With tactical flying, I don't know if how many people have been on roller coasters, tactical flying is worse than a roller coaster. Like, I get sick. And uh, so, like, never for people never being on an aircraft, a lot of the local population, when they did travel, they would get sick. So Dan was very, very nervous for this little girl. And the entire time she was on that aircraft, she just had this huge smile. So there was a lot of good that we did do when we were there. Apart from a few rocket attacks, the first rotation was relatively uneventful. During the second rotation, we uh, moved from the tents to the Canadian compound. In the Canadian compound, it was just sea containers that we were living in that they made into rooms. And we were on the third floor. Give me more on that uh, During that second roto, though, there, were, there was a lot more activity in Afghanistan than there was the previous roto. I recall May 19, 2010, when we received news that Bagram Air Base had been attacked. 
to any water. Sorry. So I recall in 2010 when we received news that Bagram Air Base had been attacked. Although not concerning, it didn't significantly alter our base's posture, so we didn't feel immediate apprehension. On May, 20, um, on May 22nd, our routine seemed like any other day. Our crew was on the day shift, working 12-hour shifts from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. As the day progressed, several of our crew members ended up getting food poisoning. Half of the guys got sick, so, and then the remainder, including Alex and myself, were okay. When we got back to our shacks, or our compound, Alex and I decided that we wanted a hot chocolate from Green Meats um, right there on the boardwalk. It was about a 10 minute walk and this was the first time Alex and I had gone anywhere without Dan because Dan was one of the five people that had gotten food poisoning. When we got to the boardwalk, it was night and uh, it was really busy. There's a lot of people playing volleyball, hockey, um, TJ Fridays actually had a lineup and Green Beans had a massive lineup. So Alex and I, we decided that, uh, sorry. My is So Alex and I, uh, we decided instead of going to Green Beans for coffee that we would go to TJ Fridays instead for food. Because there was a lineup, we probably waited outside for like two or three minutes before they seated us. And they seated us closest to the door, like closest to the exit. And uh, as we were seated, we had a rocket attack and we did our drills. Our drills are wherever you are, you take cover. If you're outside, you find a bunker and you go into the bunker. Or if you're in a building, go under a table or something. So we did our drills and we got back up and uh, the server came over, took our order, we ordered our food, and then the second rocket hit. The second rocket, um, it shook our building. Like, you could feel the blast where like the building went in and then out. And uh, at that point, everybody started running out of the restaurant. Alex and I were the closest to the door. We were the last ones out. Um, we got trampled over. When we got outside, we left. So when we came onto the boardwalk, we came up through these stairs. So at TJ Fridays, when we left, we went this way. And um, we saw where the rocket hit. The rocket actually hit these stairs right here which is where we were supposed to be. <clears throat> and uh, at the time, the people playing volleyball did not do their drills, the first rocket, and they were still there. And uh, when we looked out, they were just laying there. We didn't really know like what their status was at the time. And our rules of engagement stated that if there was a rocket attack, we were to find cover, we were not to help others because there's other people on that base that would do that role. So Alex and I, we stood outside for a couple minutes, we gathered ourselves, and we saw people scurrying off the boardwalk like rats. We uh, decided to stay inside TJ Fridays because we figured it was a 10 minute walk back to our shacks, or I call them shacks, the compound. And uh, we decided to stay in TGI Fridays. When we went back into TGI Fridays, we uh, ended up sitting closer into the middle of the restaurant. And that's when the third rocket hit. The third rocket hit a little further away from us. We did our drills once again. And uh, as we were doing our drills, other military members were getting called out. Like you could see them on their phones or radios. 
Alex, Alex and I, we didn't have that luxury. We were not provided with any comms. So we couldn't call our guys to let them know that we were okay. So they did not know what was going on at the time. So as other militaries were getting called out, Alex and I were still there. And uh, the fourth rocket hits. <clears throat> the fourth rocket hit even further away. By that time, um, the military police came into Teach at Fridays and asked that all remaining military members um, protect the 40 civilians that were in there. The civilians included the workers that were in the restaurant. Um, Alex and I, we were told to put our mags and our weapons, and that's something that it just means that your bullets, you have to have them ready to go. So because that's what we were told, we did our drill, we put our mags and our weapons, and by the end of um, like the fourth rocket attack, there was only five military members left in that building. It was Alex, myself, and then three um, US anesthesiologists. So <laughs> they were in uniform, Alex and I weren't, so we went and we introduced ourselves to them. And uh, they, we ended up starting, we, we started to cover all the doors. Um, with the workers, the majority of them were Indian, and one had a turban on, so I'm like, okay, he's Sikh. So I went up to him and I started talking to him in Punjabi. Um, I started talking to him in Punjabi, and I just asked him how many uh, co-workers he had, how many people had left the building, if everybody was okay, and uh, he let me know, and he showed me where some of the other exits were so we could go put people at the doors. Um, during that fourth rocket attack, uh, no, I'm okay. So during that fourth rocket attack, one of the workers found one of their co-workers uh, in the bathroom crying, a Filipino woman. And they sat, they just gave her to me. So she was like cowering under a table with me for a bit, just crying the entire time. Um, uh, I asked the workers at the time just to get us food and water because we didn't know how long we were gonna be there. And any food that they did have, uh, they brought out to us. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so, any food and water that they had, they brought out to us. It's just like it's dry or something in there. <laughs> Pardon? So what did you do? Would that be better? So they ended up bringing us food out. Um, the Americans they did have radios, and uh, they were they let us know what was going on. Our base was actually being attacked, and we like obviously because of where we were, we didn't exactly know. Um, and we just had to wait. So for four hours, the base was under attack. We knew that we were okay, but our, we didn't like our guys didn't know that we were okay. My main concern at the time was Dan and how he feel. Because this is the first time that the girls left without him, and we got attacked. After the four hour uh, attack, they called them all clear, and Alex and I, we made our way back to our compound, and the guys were waiting for us right then and there. They came, met us at the gates, walked us up, one of the rules that we have is anytime we enter a building, we're supposed to clear our weapon because it just makes sure that there's no grounds in it. I walked into the, um, like into our building with a loaded weapon, totally forgot. Alex, she called me back, she's like, Robin, you gotta clear it. I mean, how do I do it? I like, I completely blanked out on how to actually clear my weapon. So one of the guys took it from me, like I was just glad to be back. 
took it from me, cleared it, and uh, we went on our way. I didn't know this at the time, but um, when we got back to Dubai, um, the entire base knew that we were MIA. So I was doing gate duty, and that's something that you have to do when you're deployed. No matter what trade you are, you have to help protect that base. So when I got back to Dubai, I was on gate duty, and a couple of uh, guys came up to me. They're like, oh, we're so glad you're OK. Like, nothing happened. Like, how do you guys know? They're like, it went all the way up to Ottawa. I'm like, what? <laughs> I had no idea that that's how far the news had traveled. So that experience really showed me how mentally resilient I am. When faced with a challenging situation, I didn't panic or run away. Instead, I stood my ground and faced it head on. It taught me a lot about myself and left me feeling incredibly grateful and humble for all I have. Upon my return, I continued to work on aircraft for a year before being reassigned to second line equipment maintenance. <laughs> second line involves maintaining equipment that isn't actually installed on the aircraft. I spent a few months in this role before being tasked to work on the C-130J model Hercules. So the J model Hercules is just a newer upgraded model of the plane that I was working on. I was tasked uh, to work on periodic inspections. During this period, I was a sole ABSA level technician in this section for four years. Uh, when you get the authorization as an A-level technician, it just means that you can do the work without having someone else come behind you and sign. So I was able to do that for myself. I took the lead in carrying out modifications on the avionics systems. Because it was brand new aircraft, I was always the first one to embody the modifications on the airplane, and then I would go teach the other technicians on how to do this. During periods, I would take note of all the deficiencies on the aircraft. This helped me notice the trend. The J model aircraft are equipped, equipped with electroluminescent lights. So if you look there, that's the electroluminescent light. It's used for formation flying. So they're all over the aircraft. So if the pilots want to fly them in formation, that's what they use as their guides. The J model aircraft, sorry. During the manufacturing process of these specific lights on the wingtips, um, they would make the light and then mold it. And when they would mold the light, there would be air bubbles. Those air bubbles have moisture. When you go up into the sky, it freezes. When you come back down, it melts. It doesn't go well with electricity. It starts arcing, and then there's sparks. Um, the first aircraft we got, I noticed that, and I left Flight Safety Know and Lockheed Martin. Our aircraft right now are warranty to Lockheed Martin, so I let them know that this is going on, and they're like, don't worry about it. Just change the light. <laughs> change the light. It's a four hour process just to remove the wingtip. You can't just change the light, it's not like a light bulb. You have to take the entire wingtip off and then remove the light and then put it back on and put that wingtip on. The entire process is about two to three days for each wing. And that's like giving it time to cure and all of that because you have to put sealant on it and that's about a 48 hour cure time right there. So subsequently I countered the same issue on three more aircraft during inspection. The fifth aircraft had an actual visible burn mark on the light. So before I went and I told everybody, I recorded it, and I put it into an email, I'm like, this is what's going on. Went up to Lockheed Martin Flight Safety, and they're like, it was lightning strike. I'm like, okay. So they had to quarantine the aircraft, and with a lightning strike, there is always an insertion point and an exit point. So for a week, they tried to look for this point of insertion and they could not find it. So they're like, oh, maybe it's the manufacturing default of the light. They, uh, Lockheed Martin ended up issuing a worldwide service bulletin to address the issue. Other countries um, acknowledged the exact same problem that they were having with their lights. 
Despite the request for a redesign, the solution proposed was to replace the lights whenever the arcing occurred. It was just the redesign of it for the company would be more money than it was to, for us to just replace that light. In 2015, I was assigned to 450 Tac Hill, where operations revolved around the Siege 147 Chinook helicopter. Initially, I worked in the periodic section before transitioning to quality management. Quality management, known as AF9000 in the Air Force, ensures strict adherence to airworthiness procedures within the unit. Our responsibilities included maintaining up-to-date documentation related to maintenance and ensuring compliance with procedures outlined by A4 Maintenance and the Technical Airworthiness Authority. Initially, 450 TACO wasn't authorized to operate outside of Canada. To facilitate deployment, one CAD um, Air Division in Winnipeg had to confirm the unit's compliance with airworthiness. Within a year of my tenure at A5000, the unit was able to obtain accreditation, marking readiness for deployment to Mali. Being part of this achievement was rewarding, and when one had recognized the team for the award airworthiness flag, they specifically acknowledged my contribution to Jeff, which is a gesture that deeply touched me. In August 2020, my partner and I were assigned to the Canadian Forces School of Aerospace Engineering, Technology and Engineering in Gordon as instructors, focusing on our respective trades on avionics and use aviation. After a year in this role, I was promoted to the rank of sergeant and assumed the position of course director, responsible for managing both instructors and students. During my time in Gordon, I've actively participated in promoting the 100th anniversary of the Royal Canadian Air Force. This involved various activities such as attending air shows, to man boost without raising awareness about the RCAF Centennial. Additionally, I played a role in organizing events and contributed to the reopening of Hangar 11 Museum, a significant historical landmark dating back to the early 1900s when the Air Force was first established. It was truly an honor for me to contribute to the 100th anniversary events especially considering that this marks my final year in the military. Unfortunately, due to various injuries sustained throughout my career, I will be releasing from my service. My last day in the military will be on April 1st, 2025, culminating 19 years of dedicated service to our country. As I approach the end of my time in this organization, I can't help but feel a mix of emotions. While there's a sense of apprehension about the future, I'm also filled with pride for all that, I, for all that I have accomplished and immensely grateful for the numerous opportunities that the military has afforded me. Thank you all for being here and listening to me today. It means a lot to have your attention and have a fantastic evening. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask uh, an actress that was in a hotter come up to give our official appreciation to you if you could stay here. Thank you so much. And those those words are small compared to what you have done for Canada and, and what you continue to do. So thank you so much for coming out tonight to share your story. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you for your bravery. Thank you for being a role model for every person in this room. I'm really moved by your story. And on behalf of the Institute and Board of Directors, I would like to give you this point. Wow, thank you very much. Thank you for having This has been another in our series of webcasts produced by the Royal Canadian Military Institute in Toronto as a public educational service. You can find news of upcoming events and links to our webcast archives 
at www.rcmi.org. On behalf of the RCMI, this is Eric Morse saying goodbye for now, and thank you for joining us.